I'm coming from this position of history and philosophy of science, where it's like we've studied hundreds and hundreds of years of science and technology and how people misrepresent what it does and what it actually does, right? So we would, I would hope that we would have a critical lens on this. And it, it strikes me that there's a lot of philosophy that's simply parroting or, or lending kind of philosophical justification to these hype narratives that, you know, deep learning will radically change the face of particle physics or something like that. It's like, really? Really though? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, perhaps it's well. This is this is this is a good good place to go to. So, one one term which I really liked in the paper which you used was this idea of called the, the theory free ideal. I I really liked that 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 term because I think for me that captures what apropos philosophy of science or, or let's let's say apropos the 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 scientific method what the hope or the dream with the ML models are. So. If you could melt just just to like again to flesh this out a bit more, as as to where we are right now with the cu current uh, paradigm of machine learning, what is the epistemic status of a, of machine learning, and then could you then pr probably connect that to what 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 is this th theory free ideal, and then as you point out in your papers, what are the mistakes that people make uh, with, with, with to you know by having this ideal. Of, of science being theory free when done with a, uh, let's say an ML model, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, so I think machine learning models are statistical models that are computationally instantiated. There's, there's nothing that would in principle make the epistemic status of these technologies any different from any kind of other statistical model. Now, you're pushing yourself into really high dimensional spaces in which data is transposed. And so there's intrinsically the, the dimensionality of the patterns you're finding is much higher than what you're doing with classical statistics. But I, I, I guess I doubt that when people are doing multiple regression, they are kind of holding all the dimensions in their head in the way that they would have to be in order for the contrast that's typically drawn between deep learning and classical statistics to make sense. Like there's there's meant to be a kind of opacity, a kind of intrinsic deep unknowability of the kinds of patterns that these statistical methods, that is deep learning methods, are finding relative to classical statistical methods. And I just don't see that distinction being substantive and absolute in the way that it's proposed to be. I think these are at their heart statistical methods like other statistical methods. And if there's a difference, it's a sociological difference. Okay, I, I, I think I followed you all the way except the last bit, the sociological bit. If you could probably flesh that out. Yeah, so it's it's the corporatization of these technologies. Oh, I, see. I see. Okay. Um, it's the hype narrative. So even in a research context, there's because because machine learning. I mean, uh, uh, because machine learning is this place where stats met up with AI, and and AI is something that's always AI refers to a lot of different research traditions that have had historically very little to do with each other in terms of their their substance, in terms of their subject matter, in terms of the methods. They mostly have to do with where funding is being targeted and the kinds of narratives spun around these research methods. So there's very little substantive that holds everything that's historically been called AI, to, going back to cybernetics, going back to McCarthy, going back to you know, uh, Alan Turing, perhaps. And, Pitts and, you know, like going back all through the history of things being called artificial intelligence, there's very little that connects all of these. But 
who they're targeting for funding and the kinds of narratives they're using in convincing the public and funding bodies of what they're doing. Um, so there are methods and statistics that have been, you know, approaching something like machine learning going going back 80s 90s whatever right but where that meets up with the ai narrative you get this hype and disinformation and overselling of competence right um and so there's there's an attitude and a meta narrative surrounding machine learning that is, I think, more what sets it apart from classical statistics than anything else. I this is this is a, a spicy take. You know, I I kind of with a grain of salt, but but this is my 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 challenge is really like tell tell me what is so radically epistemically different about these technologies that they should be placed in some category that that's discrete from classical statistics. I have not seen it, you know? Mm -hmm. And you point this out. Yeah. And, and also I, I guess it's this meta narrative that, that drives it's the impetus behind this uh, theory free ideal uh, when it comes to science. Yeah. And, and there's been, so philosophers, natural philosophers, scientists have debated what theory is and what its proper role in science is since the the incipience of what we call modern science right since bacon and newton and galileo you know modern science right even going back to bacon there's 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 a kind of push for a kind of radical empiricism that pushes away as much as possible the role of theory um about just just tabulating as much data as possible and sifting through it for patterns and and not bringing our kind of conceptual infrastructure to bear on it. But then, since Hume, since Hume brought his sort of problem of induction, induction to yeah. the table in epistemology, um, there's this widespread recognition that well, all all knowledge of the natural world is knowledge by induction. You do not get deductive certainty about empirical matters. Yeah, all so knowledge since the sun rising. Is. Yeah, so the the, yeah. the typical example is the sun rising, just because it rose uh, yesterday. We can't say necessarily it'll every it'll day of our lives the sun has risen in the morning. Has risen. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. yet, give me a deductive proof. Give me logical certainty that it will rise tomorrow. There is none. There's only the the you know, the remit of our experience to tell us that it will rise tomorrow. There's no logical necessity that it will rise again tomorrow. Um, so knowledge of nature, scientific knowledge is, and, and all our kind of day-to-day -day practical knowledge, like I can eat this bread and it won't poison me because the bread I ate yesterday that I got from the same baker didn't poison me, you know. Um, this is inductive knowledge, which means we don't get deductive certainty. Hmm. And it also means that to get that kind of knowledge, you need to start off with rich conceptual infrastructure, which I'm calling theory. I think, I think when, so I think there are lots of ways that philosophers have traditionally cashed out what we mean by theory. I think that when we talk about theory-free science, we mean uh, a powerful influence at the beginning of inquiry at the, at the beginning of the investigatory procedure of our prior conceptual resources, our prior conceptual acquaintance with the target phenomena, right? We do not get, we do not get inductive inference off the ground without bringing to bear prior theory or conceptual inference. Uh, the uh, philosopher and historian of science, John Norton calls it uh, bringing to bear material facts, right? But there are lots of ways of putting it, but you need theory to get empirical knowledge off the ground. And so in this sense, you cannot have theory-free knowledge of natural systems. And I think that um, 
you can look back for hundreds of years and there's there's always this dialogue between no we should get rid of as much as much as we can push away the influence of of prior conceptualization we should do that and that's scientific objectivity this is this is i think one notion of scientific objectivity right that has been kind of implicitly in the background of a lot of discourse in philosophy natural philosophy science for hundreds of years um and then another stream that says well, you can't actually have knowledge of nature without bringing conceptual resources to bear. So it's about documenting them. It's about recognizing them. It's about, to some extent, working backwards from those assumptions and saying what which of those assumptions are, in fact, substantiated by what we've then been able to observe and deduce from what we've measured or, or observed in nature, right? Um, and what is, in fact, just arbitrary or unknown right and i think since the rise of domain generic statistical methods in the 20th century in particular you know stats really gets off the ground after the axiomatization of probability theory with komogorov statistical reasoning probabilistic reasoning is is to the extent that's so widespread in science it's it's relatively new it's really a kind of 20th century like statistical reasoning is kind of a 20th century thing i mean it, it sort of got off the ground with with you know gambling and stuff in the 17th century but you know as a scientific method it's new um and really i think since the mid century mid 20th century you get a lot of this um what i call a theory free ideal and it's in in the kind of uh, fundamental, I don't know if I believe in this designation, but in the more fundamental sciences who know how to theorize because they've been doing it for hundreds of years and know how to mathematically represent their phenomena because they've been doing it for hundreds of years, um, you get less of this. But in the younger sciences, like the quantitative social sciences, like social psychology, like um, population genetics, what have you, um, economics, there's, uh, there's this belief that the more theory free, the more data driven, the methods are the more objective they are and the more sciency <laughs> yeah so when you mean the the more fundamental you mean like physics for instance right yeah areas of areas of uh, but not all areas of physics right mm -hmm. the areas of physics that are really established 